Allegiance uh, led by Officer Ty Williams, and he has his uh, canine support with him as well today. The Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. As we remain standing, uh, our chaplain, Chaplain Richard Rucko, will come and lead us in prayer. Let's remember we're always in the holy presence of God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Good and gracious God, we thank you for the many graces and blessings that you bestow upon us. We ask in a special way that you watch over our men and women of this beloved city who continue to care for us and to support us and to protect us, especially this coming weekend when we will have thousands of visitors, especially give them the strength to continue to guide and direct those in need. We ask that you pray and bless in a special way our Board of Commissioners for their continued guidance and leadership uh, throughout our city. Uh, continue to bring us closer to your son Jesus. And we ask this through the intercessions of St. Michael, the Archangel. And we ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Oh, it's online. All right. Looking for the mayor. He's online. Good morning, Mayor Lucas. Yeah, that might be a picture of it. All right, but all right. Uh, guest presentation: Third Quarter Community Policing Prevention Fund. Uh, Auditor Doug Jones. <laughs> Good morning, Board President Tolbert, members of the Board of Police Commissioners. Dr. Good morning. Good to be with you. Thank you. I'm here to present our Auditor Police Department spending from the Community Policing and Prevention Fund for the third quarter of this uh, year's yes, presentation. There's a delay. Okay. okay. Uh, I will discuss the audit objective, provide a little bit of background, summarize our findings, copies of the report, the highlights page and presentation slides should be in tab A of your board book. The audit team for this project was Jonathan LeCure and Kara Jorgensen. In March 2022, City Council passed Ordinance 220216, creating the Community Policing and Prevention Fund. The ordinance also directed the City Auditor to conduct quarterly audits of the Board of Police Commissioner's efforts to meet the City expectations as outlined in the ordinance and report to the Council as soon as practical after the end of each quarter. Our audit focuses on whether the Police Department spent the CPP fund as expected by the Council during the quarter. To answer our objective, we assessed the method the department developed for reporting the fund spending and summarized all reporting categories. For the third quarter, we verified officers and staff were correctly reported in the categories of 911 call takers and communication unit and violent crimes division victim and witness support services. We also verified the accuracy of reported changes in the number of recruits in the academy classes. We conducted the audit in accordance with government auditing standards with the exception of reporting the views of management concerning the audit because we did not make any recommendations. We did, however, share the draft with management to get their comments to see if there was any things that we needed to correct in that. Ordinance 220216 establishes the city's expectations regarding the police department's expenditure of $33.36 million in these 12 categories during fiscal year 2023. The department reported allocating about 19% of the fund in the third quarter. The department spent about 71% of the fund through the third quarter of fiscal 2023. A summary of the spending allocated to each category is shown in exhibit one on page three of the report. The department reported allocating personal expenses of $967,587 for 65 new officer salaries to the CPP fund during the third quarter. The 65 officers included lateral recruits, officers graduated from the academy now on assignment, and current academy classes. Lateral recruits are officers who worked in law enforcement agencies other than Kansas City prior to joining the department. These officers do not need to attend full academy session. 
We verified the eight lateral recruit start dates and assignments to division. Because the CPF eligible officers had not yet been charged to the fund, their third quarter charge included previous quarters they worked for the department. Another city expectation was funds spent for 911 call takers and communications unit operations. The department reported allocating nearly $1.5 million to 911 call takers and communications expenses in this fund during the third quarter. The department charged between 77 and 82 full-time positions over seven pay periods in the third quarter expenses. The Board of Police Commissioners also approved the transfer of $50,000 from personnel services to contractual services within the 911 category in the CPP fund to assist the department in meeting call taker needs during the quarter. The department allocated $12,885 in contractual services to pay for eight contract employees in the communications unit for the third quarter. The last category we reviewed were the Violent Crimes Division Victim and Witness Support Services. The department allocated $1,253,269 million for about 120 officer salaries in various units of the division during the quarter. This amount exhausted the $7 million appropriated for the fund for the fiscal year. The department reported only allocating personal expenses to this category. Exhibit 4 shows the department's allocation per pay period of officers by the Violent Crime Division activity. We did, again, we did not request a response because we did not make any recommendations. I do wanna thank staff and management in the police department for their assistance and cooperation throughout this audit. This concludes my presentation. What questions do you have? You present this to the city council? We will, we are waiting to present this at a council business session, likely sometime in May. City Council will know that we were out of money for violent crimes at the end of the third quarter. We'll report this to the council, yes. Thank you. Commissioner, may I say something? Yes. Um, to year to date, um, we've, um, fiscal division uh, staff has, has made this a heavy lift. Um, and if it's, it's a lot of hands on deck, all work um, by everyone involved to the tune of 279 hours of work were put into just providing the information for this audit. So I appreciate that. And I wanted to recognize them for all of their, their hard work. I'm sure the auditor's office knows how much time it takes to do an audit. I don't know that the city council knows how much time it takes to provide the information for them to do an audit, but I appreciate knowing. So with that, the fourth quarter is coming to a close and we'll just wait to get the information from the department and we will come back sometime June, July with our final report of the quarterly spending through fiscal year 2023. We may look at a little more detail. There could be recommendations in that audit. So we're gonna take a little more time getting that fourth quarter report out because that's gonna be the wrap up for this fiscal year. So the, you know, I, I hope that the public realizes that our efforts to make sure that we cooperate to show how the money was spent, um, even though that money is a part of our budget, we are trying to show the city council that we're willing to work with them because we all have the same, pretty much the same objectives. And so we appreciate uh, your audit, but we also appreciate the department that had, I didn't realize it was this many hours uh, invested in supplying the material. And that's in addition to their already busy, busy schedule. Some had to come in on the uh, on their time off, stay late, come in early to accomplish this because of all the things they have going on day to day. So uh, again, hats off to the entire team. They did a fantastic job. In a timely manner, I would say as, as well. Third quarter was the quickest we'd seen it come through, yes. So we were really happy to get it as quick as we did and just managed to get through all the work. So we've been really happy with the cooperation we received from the department. Thank you. Thank was you. the amount of hours spent comparable for the other two quarters as well? Let's see. Um, yes, I mean, it varied. The first quarter, because, you know, it's growing pains, we we spent 113 um, hours. Second quarter was 93. Third quarter was 72. So 
as we went through this, we kind of worked the, the bugs out and the growing right. pains on both sides of uh, this project. So I think we experienced similar. It took us a while to get the first one done. And as we do it, it uh, the hours came down as we continued doing these audits. But it might go up a little bit on this one because we're going to spend more time on the fourth quarter. And we will continue this cooperative relationship uh, with City Council and um, City Hall and the mayor just to make sure that everyone knows um, exactly how our money is spent. And if we were to enter another an agreement such as not, or, agree, or an audit, excuse me, um, such as this, then obviously we are, will be full and forthcoming on, on how that money is spent. We've also... Um, had our city council people that we've invited over here to, to look at our budget, to go over our budget. And that's not going to be just during budget season. That's going to continue throughout the year so that everyone knows. And there's some transparency on how KCPD spends their money. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, city council presentation, mayor's designee, Mayor uh, Lucas, who is your designee for today? I think there's a little lag, so we'll. Mayor Lucas, can you hear us? I see him moving, but I, I don't know if we can. Hey, can anyone hear me? Lag, so we'll. Yeah, we can hear you. Oh, okay. Can anyone hear me? Yes. Can anyone hear me? Yes. Can you hear us? I can hear you. Can anyone hear me? Yes. <laughs> All right. No, no presentation. No presentation. No presentation. So he said no presentation, correct? All right. Uh, Investigation Bureau, Deputy Chief uh, Luis Ortiz. Good morning. Turn your mic on. There you go. My information is under tab B in your books. On the following pages, you will see the daily homicide analysis report or blue sheet with some information for you. You will see that in 2023, we had 52 homicides compared to 49 in 2022. The five-year average of homicides is 46. At this time in 2021, we had 48 homicides, 45 in 2020, and 45 in 2019. We clear 18 homicides in this year. We also clear seven homicides that happened in previous years for a total of 25 cases clear in 2023. But I also wanna mention that we also solved 14 cases, 14 cases that eight of them were waiting for a decision from our prosecutors. Five of them were only waiting for additional information such as lab request and other information that we need, but we already know who the suspect is. Out of the 52 cases that we have, only nine cases we need more information in. This is where we want to encourage our members of the community to come up with information if they have any information to call us or, or to call the TIPS hotline with additional information. You also have a copy of the non-fatal shooting comparison report. You'll find that from January 1st to April 24th, there were 141 non-fatal shooting victims in 2022, we had 131 victims during the same time period. This is up 8% compared to last year. In March 2023, we had 36 non-fatal shooting victims compared to 36 also in March of this year or the previous year, which is uh, no change for the month. Please direct your attention to the March 2023 non-fatal shooting report listed under tab B on page two. You will see on your report that of the 36 non-fatal shooting victims in March, 25 were cooperative at the time of the investigation. That's a 69% cooperation. As you can see, black males 
accounted for the highest number of known fatal shooting victims with 23 or 63 percent. Black females and white males were second with five victims or 14 percent each. White females, Hispanic males, and Asian males were the remaining three victims with one in each category or 3% each. The age groups with the highest number of known fatal shooting victim was 25 to 34 with nine. 18 to 24 was second with eight. The third was 35 to 44 with seven. Next is 45 and over with six. And that remaining age groups were 17 and younger with five. We identified seven suspects. Six of the suspects were black males and one was a white male. There were three suspects in the age group of 35 to 44 and two suspects were 25 to 34 and one in each of the age groups, zero to 17 and 18 to 24. On page five, you will see that recover firearms report. We recover 181 firearms in March, 2023. <clears throat> compared to 211 in March of 2022. The five-year average for firearms recover in March is 210. On page six, six through 16, you will find the monthly case submissions and dispositions reports. We submitted a total of 260 cases to county prosecutors. 211 of those cases were to Jackson County, 38 to Clay County, 11 to Platte County, and zero to Cass County. Prosecutors filed charges on one or two cases during the month. 32 cases were charged in custody and we got 72 warrants or they issued 72 warrants. 12 cases were returned for additional work and 94 cases were declined. These numbers include cases that were submitted in previous months but came back in March, 2023. Declinations, we had 43 cases for Special Investigation Divisions, 31 for Violent Crimes Division, 19 for Property Crimes, and one for Traffic. 88 of those 90 declinations were from Jackson County. Prosecutor discretion was the most cited reason for declination with 37, followed by insufficient evidence with 33. When, when the prosecutor says, or gives you a paper that says, my discretion. Do they mm -hmm. explain that at all? Or do you try and go and talk to them about what the issue is? Correct. And some of these cases, then we review depending on what they need. If they need an example, uh, form records, then we will go back and get those form records and then resend it. And then they will review that again. And then if that case is good for them with that information, then they will file if not, they will send us another recommendation. And that's why we hear that sometimes many of the cases from previous months, we got them back in March. All right, but in the criteria that you've done on this report, it's you know need further information, a couple of different areas, but you're saying they declined. So they just didn't tell you that they needed more information? In many of the cases, for example, special victims unit that some of them later on, they don't want to continue the investigation. Then they had to decline that because of lack of victims cooperation. Many of the cases that we have, sometimes we don't have enough evidence for the suspect, but we submit the case just in case because the victims are, for example, juveniles. And even though that doesn't go anywhere, we know that it's not going to go anywhere because of lack of evidence or lack of statements or additional evidence. We know that that case is going to be declined, but we want to send it only because we know the nature of the investigation and, and the victims. Does that make sense? It does. Thank you. Thank you. Unless you have any additional questions, that is it for me. All right. Thank you. Uh, Administration Bureau, I'm sorry, Patrol Bureau, Deputy Chief Joseph Mabin. Morning, Commissioners. Morning. Morning. My information is under tab C in your books, or you can also follow along on your screen. Thank you. Yeah. 
Here's the median response time report. The top chart shows the median response time for priority 10 calls. That's calls that present extreme danger to human life. The median response time for March 2023 was approximately 7.7 .7 minutes or seven minutes and 40 seconds. That's a six second increase from the previous month. Bottom chart shows the median response time for priority 20 calls. Calls where a potential for danger exists, but no injuries have been reported yet. Median response time for priority 20 calls was approximately 9.8 minutes or nine minutes and 46 seconds. That's a 20 second increase from the previous month. And as a reminder, these reports measure the amount of time it takes officer, officers to respond once a call taker enters a call for service. The average 911 hold time for the month was 35 seconds. The average hold time for the previous month was 27 seconds. Now remember, we're reporting median response times for, for patrol officers arriving to the calls and average response times, or excuse me, average 911 hold times. But in an attempt to provide more complete picture of the time it takes for an officer to arrive on the scene from the moment someone dials 911, we can add the two measurements together. I mean, it's not exactly apples and, and it's kind of apples and oranges, but for a part approximate time, we can add those, those two times together. So for March, it took approximately eight minutes and 15 seconds for a priority 10 call. And for our priority 20 call, it was approximately 10 minutes and 21 seconds. I think that's the number that we've been, or you've been asking for. And how, how can we reduce that? We get more officers on the streets. Mm. Okay. We'll, we'll reduce, reduce more that. officers on the streets and more call takers. And more call takers. Yep. Okay. Exactly. Because I think one of the things that stands out when I hear news reports from around the country, like this last shooting in Nashville, they they made a a point to say the officers got there within three minutes. So in a shooting situation. Thank God we haven't had one, but like that, how how quickly do you think our police department would respond to something like that? Well, it <clears throat> depends on the individual situation mm -hmm. because officers oftentimes are in the area. And so you have some that are response times that are a lot faster than you have other ones that were slower. And so this is a uh, median is, you know, pulling that, that number that's in the middle between that high and low outliers averages is, is obviously a, a, a average so it's hard to tell um but uh and for instance in, in center zone where it's a smaller concentration uh you know the borders are smaller then our response times are are, are less so it's, it's no way of telling but um i would like to think that that you know we respond as soon as as, as we can in these situations I have a little bit on that. Um, <clears throat> so if we were, if, if you're talking specifically about an, about an active shooter, if we had a situation where that was toned out over the radio that we have an active shooter, that would be a situation where if officers are already uh, committed on another call, but that call wasn't, um, didn't present the danger as such of, of whatever the nature of that call is, we will have officers that will end that call immediately to go to an active shooter situation. So, yeah. so that is, is part of that, that response. Yeah. And now if we're committed on a situation where we have someone who is in, um, you know, like a, a life-threatening situation, obviously that that's there's some calls that we just cannot leave because right. we're al already obligated to be there. But we're in a situation where there's a stolen bike or something like that, an active shooter comes out. Well, then we're not, we can be uncommitted from that, that call and immediately respond to, to a, a bigger incident. Next slide. This slide shows the median response time for priority 20 and 10 calls broken out by division. Priority 10 calls are displayed on the left chart. And as you can see, there was an increase in response times in north, south, metro, and east patrols from the previous month, and a decrease for Shoal Creek and Central Patrol Division. Then on the right, you have priority 20 calls for service, average response times, or median response times increase for South and Metro patrols and decrease for Shoal Creek, North, East, and Center Patrol Division.
Moving on to the March 2023 traffic summary report. The chart at the top shows the citywide total crash statistics. In March 2023, there were a reported 1,537 vehicle accidents. That's a 17% increase from March of 2022. From January 1 this year through March 31st, there were 4,336 vehicle accidents. That's a 19% increase from 2022 during the same time period. The bottom chart shows the number of traffic fatalities in 2023. From the beginning of the year through the end of March, there were 16 traffic fatalities compared to 29 during the same period in 2022. And as of yesterday morning, there were 22, excuse me, 22 traffic fatalities compared to 32 for the same period last year. That's a 31% decrease. So while accidents are up compared to last year, there have been fewer fatal accidents. This slide shows fatal crash, excuse me, fatal crash statistics through March 31st. One item of note that is not shown on the slide is that there were six fatal accidents in March and four of those involved a pedestrian. So we wanna make sure that uh, drivers are aware and on the lookout for pedestrians, especially as we head to the summer months and warmer weather and people are more out and about. Do you think that more people are wearing seat belts. Are there any statistics taken as to whether people are wearing seat belts since there are more crashes but fewer fatalities? Uh, we, I could go back and look and compare seat belt use um, at this time this year compared to last year, but we do follow that. And usually at the end of the year, we have a comprehensive report. And I will say seat belt use, speed impairment. Those are always uh, the leading factors when it comes to a fatality versus uh, injury accident. This slide shows our DUI, excuse me, driving under the influence and driving while revoked wolf pack enforcement activity for the month. We had 10 wolf pack operations in which we conducted 128 stops and made 74 DUI arrests during those operations operations alone. Uh, do you have any questions on the traffic report? Now we'll have our monthly community engagement division report by Major Kari Thompson. Uh, while they're coming, how, how's our uh, parking control partnership going? We can have a, a, a detailed report next month, but I will say that during this previous month, we had two uh, parking control officers who were previously in training and they graduated, they're back full online. And so our parking uh, enforcement and citations uh, went way up compared to previous months. So we're, we're, we're moving ahead on those. As I've seen news reports about uh, residents putting orange cones out <laughs> so people won't park in front of their house during I, this. I saw that. Thing. Um, so it's going to be challenging this weekend. Right. And we, we continue to encourage people to call 311 and, and report or non emergency numbers. And we, we do get these complaints and we work, do work these complaints. But yet, that is going to be a concern during the draft, just with the huge influx of people. Right. So I, I'm sorry. But so, but we have a parking arrangement with another entity is that correct or are we still handling that right it's 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 split and most of our PO, pcos are doing the traffic complaints at the city at large and then downtown is a uh, another entity who's That's primarily doing those okay hired by the city right, right. how do you deal with what the example that the bishop just gave of someone putting cones out in front of their house. Oh, it's, it's a challenge. But once we receive the complaints, uh, then we'll dispatch our, our parking control officer to that area. Or sometimes an officer will have to go if someone is, is per se, blocking a driveway and it's an immediate need. But we'll ticket those and, and enforce. And You can't ticket cones. No, the cars. <laughs> but what, I'm saying, what do you do if... if 
If I go out in front of my house and I put two cones, I'm allowed to do that? No, I wouldn't say that. Uh, that's a, <laughs> that would we'd handle those those matters on a case by case basis. But we recognize that that people are frustrated and people parking, you know, in front of their. But yeah, you're right. Unless it's a um, marked handicap sign, you know, people don't don't own this street. Yeah. But we're we're very well versed at, at handling those disputes. So please give us a call and we will de deescalate exactly. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, hello, hello. hello. President hello. Tolbert, uh, Board of Police Commissioners, Chief Graves, the Executive Board, and to all who are gathered here today, good morning. Good morning. Let's start with the start. Let's start at the beginning. Let's start with our Patrol Bureau highlight. So on April 13th, uh, in the area of 34th and North Jackson, uh, members of KCPD were called out on a missing autistic child. Uh, they were advised that a 17-year-old boy who was autistic and nonverbal walked away from his home barefoot. Turns out that he was in the woods, and it took about 30 minutes of walking into the woods to finally locate him. Officer Bradley Raines located the young man who was able to share that his feet were hurting. Uh, Sergeant Billy Dotson arrived and gave him a piggyback out of the woods. So I just want to highlight these two amazing gentlemen uh, who were able to help this young man and this family during a very tumultuous time. Um, this young man was really deep into the woods, and but for the dedication and the not giving up attitude of our members of KCPD uh, is the reason why we were able to locate him. So thank you very much, Officer Bradley Raines and Sergeant Billy Dodson. We have a new member of the Community Engagement Division, and that new member is Sergeant Joe Marino. He is here today. Will you stand, please, sir, and wave? Hello. All righty. Sergeant Joe Marino has had 23 years with KCPD. He's been a sergeant for eight years. He's presently supervising our community interaction officers. Outside of work, he likes to spend time with his family, going to his kids' games and activities, and he has been called Dad Uber. I can say from personally interacting with Joe that he has a heart. He is compassionate and it is so kind. Uh, he's pretty quiet. So for my uh, me being so outgoing, I have to get used to him being so quiet. So, But I am so thankful for him. Uh, welcome to our division. Thank you. So our community highlight of the month is the Transition Center of Kansas City. The restorative reentry community uh, at TCKC promotes a college campus atmosphere with more than 50 community partners. They offer unique programs and activities from digital skills to Tibetan yoga. <laughs> a wide range of programs and resources are there to empower these residents in their journey from where they have been, which is incarceration, to where they are going. Residents create new paths to success by furthering their education, learning job readiness skills, and obtaining employment, and discovering self-improvement needs that are specific to each resident. We had an opportunity to join these men uh, last week and were amazed that we had more in common than we'd had not in common. These men offered, um, they opened up to us as we opened up to them, and we were able to bring down walls that had typically been there because of the way that they got where they are. Uh, we are looking forward to not only delving into prevention, intervention, and enforcement, but we are also looking to move into the arena of reentry. We have other partners such, such as Second Chance and the like that are helping us find our way where we can be a part of their reentry into society. So we are very thankful to the men and women that work tirelessly over at the Transition Center of Kansas City. Lastly, we have just a quick video.
That concludes the presentation for today. If I may take just a little uh, latitude here to the life changers, the members of the Community Engagement Division. Your dedication, your tireless resolve, your compassion, and how you bless the city daily and all that you do. I am so grateful to serve Kansas City for you. To the members of CED that are here in the room today and to those who are out changing the world, we are grateful, we are thankful, and that concludes our presentation today. Did you ever drive to Chicago or flew to Chicago? They drove. Wow. Yes, road two trip. vans. <laughs> road trip. Many of the children that went on this road trip had not been out of the uh, square miles of Kansas City wow. for quite some time. So going to Chicago was the first step. Uh, we are pretty lofty in our goals, and we're hoping to, uh, in the future, maybe get them to Florida or California. Many of them have not been to the beach. Thank you. Wow. Thank you. That concludes the Patrol Bureau's uh, report. Thank you. Great report. Uh, Administration Bureau, Deputy Chief Doug Nehemiah. Good morning. My items will be under tab D, but as everyone else, you can follow along with the presentation. You. You're welcome. Uh, first item, and I'll, I'll reiterate what Deputy Chief Maven said. These numbers are, are from the end of March, and the way the board meetings fall later in the month, each month now we're kind of 20 days behind on the numbers. Um, I'm going to give you a few numbers. As of March the 31st, law enforcement strength was 1,105 officers. When it says police officer candidates at the time, it says 38. So we actually have... 52 as of today um, between the three classes. As these numbers would be, we hired, we have the 176 class, which is 24, and then we were hiring police officer candidates. They were working in records, patrol desks. So that's where you come up with the number of 38. They all were not in the academy, and we'll discuss the academy classes here shortly. We have 509 professional staff. So law enforcement hiring numbers for the month. Right now, we currently have 25 in the hiring process, somewhere within the process. Um, we have a total of three rehires coming through the process. And just this past Saturday, we had, we had a test at the academy and 34 people passed. So they will be added to that 24 to make a total of 59 people in the process to hopefully um, one day become a police officer. Communications hiring numbers total. We had nine total new hires. We have three job offers pending as of now. And in the process, somewhere in the hiring process, we have 13. And also it was asked that I, uh, by the by the staff back in communications to thank Commissioner Dean for everything that she did. She They, they made a point to make sure, they told myself and Sergeant King, please, please say thank you in, in the public eye. So. That's from the communications unit. We are going to leave this slide up here. The chief asked me almost weekly, can we find some detention officers? Well, we need detention officers. That's one of the places that right now we are struggling to hire. Um, we are really looking for anyone. We've, we've made a push and a change on how we um, try to recruit this position. I will say it again. You can, you can start as a detention officer here at 18. When you graduate high school, you can start here as a detention officer, which we, um, you, you start your career in that position. Uh, a few years later, you would be able to apply for the academy and, and start your law enforcement career as well. So anyone who knows anyone that's looking for that, we are always looking for detention officers. So on that line, on the detention officers, how many detention facilities are we operating right now? Because I know we had shut down a few, right? Because of staffing. Correct, and it's varied. It depends on, like for instance, we'll, we might open up one for the draft, uh, South Patrol when it had previously been closed. Uh, Metro is always open, East is, is always open. So it, it kind of depends on, on staffing levels.
So our our recruiting events that I wanted to to highlight and and I want those folks to know. I I have said it every month the last few months, um, and I will continue to say it. They are really really putting in the extra effort, time, and energy, and it's just not our our three folks that work necessarily directly in employment. It's the entire building there at 901 Charlotte that is participating, whether their job is titled recruitment or not recruitment. Everyone is, is um, part of the, part of the process. The event there on your left uh, is a picture from the Northland career center event. They, that group came and actually presented here at the board, Northland career center law enforcement section, which was officer Bruns. We have currently 38 current police officers on this police department that has come out of that high school uh, setting. We also, this year at that recruiting event, had IT get several names and also our folks at the garage, at our, at our, our mechanics. Uh, they were pleasantly surprised to have people sign up to be interested in working here at the KCPD. So it's not just law enforcement, it's also our professional staff and that. And also we had a really good recruiting event at Fort Riley. As uh, they told me, I, they were very excited to show me the list of names. They have two complete lists, two pages full of names. And while they're standing there, two of those folks just tested this past week. They've got on their phone, signed up, they were at the test this past week. So that was a that was a big month for this group, and I, I really appreciate. It. I would I would name all their names, but then I'll I'll forget someone and leave them out. And I just want to say the entire building at 901 Charlotte is amazing. Okay, our regional police academy. Yesterday we started class 178, 24 new recruits sat in this room yesterday and started their career. Um, it's very exciting. Many of them we have already employed for months or a month or two months. Those are the folks that we saw at the records unit and test clerks, but they are now the 178th class and will begin their training. The 176th class just completed their uh, situational training April 17th through the 20th. That class will graduate next week. So as of next Thursday, May the 4th at 6 p.m. at the Regional Police Academy, we will have a graduation ceremony, and then on May the 7th will be their first day on the street. And, oh, can you go back one? And that picture is their, their class run. They start here at police headquarters, and they ran to the corner of um, Truman and Benton uh, to honor Officer Mulbauer, Champ, and Mr. Eckes. Some of the highlights from the month, um, and I'll show a video about this in a minute. ICAT training, um, the chief wants the entire department to be trained in this by the end of the year, which is a a, 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 a lot of work for, for the academy staff and others, but we're gonna get it done. Um, we had our ICAT training, which stands for Integrating Communications Assessment and Tactics. We had 40 plus Officers go through the training a couple weeks ago as they train the trainer. They will be training all of the other officers at their patrol division stations. Uh, I said the NCC event, and I'd like to say our next recruited class will begin July the 23rd, and we already have what we believe to be seven confirmed for the July class, and then the additional folks that we have are out recruiting now. And I want to make an ICAT is, can you explain that a little bit more? Yep, I'm gonna show you a video as soon as as soon as soon this is. It was, uh, as you can see in the in the one, we had the news, the news station. We, had, we brought them, uh, I think it's Fox 4 came, filmed that day so they can get an idea. And I think the video will say it much better than I can, I can say it. But you said what the initials stand for. Yes, say it's it integrating communications assessment and tactics. Basically it's de-escalation training. Right. That's what it is. Um, and today I'm, I don't have the firm date, but the two classes, July the 23rd will be what would be the 179th class. And we'll be having another academy class in October. That's our goal. So the last slide is the video that was taken and uh, the video that was taken during our ICAT training. Uh, once again, we had the, we had the news media with us so they could, they could see it. And, and I think this is a good job of reporting it.
Yeah, good afternoon, you guys. It was really interesting to be able to sit on that training here today at the Academy. The 45 officers who went through the training, they went through three different scenarios here inside, varying levels of what these subjects were going through, but all of them had in common that they were either emotionally disturbed, they were going through some sort of mental health crisis. Now, the video that you are seeing is of that training today. It, there is no sound because of the nature of bat and not a gun, guys. So Kelly, talk a little bit about why this kind of training is so important and, and now in this time. Yeah, well, we talked to Major Paul Lester with the Academy here in Kansas City, and he said right now in the U.S., there's really a mental health crisis affecting so many people. And so especially right now, police officers are finding themselves in situations like they went through training today more and more. So he said it's really important and even critical that officers here in our community and across the country are armed with different types techniques and different tactics to be able to de-escalate situations so that when they are on a scene and something like this is happening in real life, they know exactly what they do and they have more tools in their toolkits. That's what um, Paul was referring to earlier that they can use to try and help, you know, de-escalate the situation and again, make sure everyone goes home safely. Yeah. I mean, it looks really interesting, Kelly, the, the clips we've been showing, I know we can't play the audio for obvious reasons with some rough language but those actors look very convincing with the, the officers like impressed i mean did, this, did it seem to you like this was like oh my god this is like a real thing Oh, yeah, absolutely. Me and Josh Collins, my photographer, we, I mean, we kind of talked about the situations after and we're just like, wow, because the actors, they really got into it. You know, there was a, real emotions that you could kind of tell that some of the officers maybe either, you know, have come across situations like this in the field before, or, you know, they could just kind of really sense that this is something that could actually happen or that they could face, you know, moving forward. There were situations where a woman, um, you know, she had found out some not so pleasant information about a family member. And so, you know, she was crying and she was really into the moment. And so it really gave police officers real life experience, obviously, in a controlled setting of things that, you know, people are high emotions and they're not in a very great mental state so that they can really talk through and, you know, connect and have empathy with that subject and just make sure that the situation was de-escalated the best that they could and to help them, you know, after the situation moving forward. That I think it was good that we we, we brought the media in to, to see firsthand. I, I thought that was an excellent report on mm -hmm. the training. Um, I also want to thank the academy staff because this is going to be a large undertaking to train uh, on top of the normal in-service training that we have. So I do thank Major Lester and his staff and, and all the academy staff. And, and mind you, the folks that were the very first class of, of ICAT training that will take this back and then they'll train there. Their, their division station. So that concludes my report, unless you have any other questions. Oh, uh, thank you. And thank you, Chief, because that is uh, great training that is much needed, uh, the de-escalation. So thank you. And that's one of those trainings that I talked about when I was putting in for this position. And um, I just appreciate um, Deputy Chief Niemeyer and, and Paul Lester uh, really bringing that in quick. Um, we've already had people trained and I've, I've just been here since December 15th. So, um, I appreciate the, the pace at which our police department is, is doing good things. Awesome. Any other questions, comments? Uh, Executive Services Bureau, Deputy Chief Derek McCollum. Good morning, commissioners. All morning. items for the Executive <laughs> Services Bureau are located under tab E of your board book. Item A, adoption of fiscal year 2023-24 budget. I request the adoption of the annual budget to operate the police department for fiscal year 2023-24. The total budget for appropriations from all sources 
is $284,242,620. This budget recognizes appropriations of $261,050,580 from the city and $23,192,040 from other sources. In addition, existing appropriations will be reestablished for encumbrances deemed by the city to be continuing in nature and grants. The exact amount of appropriations to be reestablished in fiscal year 23-24 cannot be determined until after fiscal year 22-23 books are closed. We are committed to continuing our recruitment efforts and paying our members a competitive wage. The budget does include a 4.95% pay increase for those at the top of their pay scale in May and a step increase for all others on their anniversary date. In this fiscal year, we will eliminate steps 12 and 13 of the professional staff pay scale, bringing the minimum hourly rate from $15.55 per hour up to $17.50 an hour. This increase benefits roughly 177 members and impacts the budget by projected cost of 640,000. This budget provides a $500 incentive for recruitment efforts and is available to all department members except those in selected assignments. I would like to finish by thanking the entire uh, fiscal division staff. Um, it was truly um, a difficult time and all hands on deck as it is uh, with most things that they do down there. Um, but I would be remiss if I didn't uh, specifically mention manager, uh, budget manager, Christine Ryder, who, who oftentimes, if not all times, uh, shoulders the, the brunt of preparing the budget. So Christine, thank you. We thank you too, Christine. We rely on you a lot. I, Red. Um, I have a question, but yes. I don't, if, if you're, are you done with what you were going to talk about on the budget and thanking people? Um, yes. I, I received a letter recently, the chief's letter about reimbursement for overtime. Now this is overtime from the um, Super Bowl parade and Super Bowl other expenses. And first I want to, test my memory. It's my recollection that when something like that happens, for instance, the uh, World Series parade, and then later another Super Bowl parade, the city traditionally reimburses the department for those unexpected and over-the-top expenses. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am, that is correct. All right. But this year, so far, the city's not done that, correct? Correct, they have not. But we expect them to. What are we going to do? I mean, we need, it was, remind me of the number, $204,000? $200,400. $200,400 in overtime. And that includes the special expenses, about 13000 where the mayor specifically said, would you please let me take my security detail to Arizona, which of course he wanted that and we want our mayor to be protected. And so we said, yes, but we always assumed that the city as in the past would pay for it. That was $13,000, right? Yes, it was. All right. How much time do we have between today and the end of the year to get the city to pay that? Um, we're yeah, we're running out of time. I mean, they would have to um, do an ordinance and IATV it over to us. Um, we sent two letters to them, one back shortly following the um, Super Bowl parade and then the most recent one that you received. Mr. Mayor, can you please tell me how quickly this can be acted upon so that we have the money that the city owes us? I don't know if you can hear me. I can. Yeah, it's 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 my view. 
Okay. Um, it's my view that uh, budget transfers, and that's between the city and the board of police commissioners, are still governed by our 2021 Jackson County Circuit Court decision. So uh, my view, and it has been the view of the city since then, is that we have not done direct transfers as from the city of Kansas City, Missouri, to the board of police commissioners. We have spoken to the Kansas City Sports Commission, which we also funded for the parade and other Super Bowl related festivities about um, either an allocation for us to them, help cover, or them using additional funds that the city had provided, which was roughly $750,000. For our special events, it's likely how we are going to fund all of those if outside of the budget cycle. So even though the city in the past has always paid for these extraordinary expenses, you're saying the city's not going to do it this year? It's my view that after the board and the city's litigation, the nature of, of how we elect to fund has modified. I, I think that's actually the view of everyone, and indeed the board of police commissioner continues on current litigation related there too, as does the city, frankly, and as do I personally. And so we are trying to find a way that won't, run afoul, at least with any of our legal understandings, as to how we handle transfers. We're always happy to do something different, but uh, as I expressed, or at least as someone expressed, the command staff, I would think that that is probably a full board city council discussion, rather than using some alternative process. Well, so, wait, wait a second. So when you asked us to send your security detail to Arizona, you never intended to pay for that? Uh, it's, it's not, I mean, that seems oddly like a personal attack. I think the Board of Police Commissioners makes a decision on whether the mayor has a security detail and where, actually, command staff. If you wish to modify it or eliminate it, I understand that, and um, many cities have not done that, but I mean, I, I think that I've answered the question, at least as it relates to funding obligations, as we've all understood them since October of 2021. So I have a question because now we have the draft coming up and we're going to have a lot of overtime as well with that. And so we're to assume that we're not going to get paid for that either. And I've also, um, I, I would like to ask on the mayor's detail, I know we have a lot of overtime and we spend a lot of money towards that. I mean, isn't that normally in most cities? Wouldn't that come out of the city budget? And what are our numbers on that so far? That's coming out of uh, the I would, budget. I would argue it isn't be funded under the city. I mean, the city budget allocation already. But if out of a $280 million budget, we wish to debate the mayor's detail, I would offer this invitation. We are welcome to eliminate it if you wish. Um, that's not a decision that I crafted in terms of having a mayor's detail to precede it my time in office and maybe it will succeed it, maybe it will not. I think that our understanding on the city side is that since the resolution, at least of one form of our litigation in October of 2021, right, fund transfers were done at the time of an appropriations period the city. That was actually in Judge Campbell's order. That's how we continue to operate it. I will know that when we fund special events, such as the NFL draft and the Chiefs of Bowl Parade, we usually come either with a quasi-governmental agency or an organization like the Sports Commission of Kansas City. For the NFL, the city is allocating $3 million, $1.5 million, already included additional $1.5 million to come. I see no limit in how that could be funded. Um, and, and I would actually have I've made that request previously to make sure that there is a police overtime estimate. Um, however, I do think Another thing that I take from Judge Campbell's decision is that what we're not trying to build necessarily just a simple pay as you go in connection with other, we're supposed to come to some appropriations and understanding uh, in our March budget time at the city and the succeeding Board of Police Commissioners determination. So I thought we had had a discussion about invoice in the city. Well, that's what this letter was. That was the formal. Um, invoice or ask that that's our way we have several ways of doing it but um the letter is 
is one way. We deliver that letter to all city council members, city manager, and the mayor. Yeah. I, I mean, but a, a letter is a communication. An invoice is saying, pay this. So I, I, I think there's a difference. Um, well, Christine. this this far into the uh, the budget cycle, that would create an imbalance in our in our books and wouldn't allow us to, to close them out like we need to. And it would show us having encumbrances that we have no way of, of funding. So several months ago, this would have been um, a, a good option to do it, but doing the formal letter is, is not a wrong way of doing it. Right. It, it is right. a standard practice. Yeah. I mean, cause earlier in the year we gave back over 500,000 for overtime that they were giving us right? For 18th and buying. We that did. We, shouldn't we have been agreed. In our budget. Right. It, it was in our budget. Um, and then the board agreed to send that money back to the city and the city agreed to accept it. So it, so it we can be done. I mean, we can of, do. Right. Right. We we're being good stewards of the budget. So yes. I guess I have a problem just trying to understand you know, where we're at and why this hasn't gotten paid. Cause in the past, the mayor has been very clear about supporting us and the budget and just taking it over to city council, city manager and asking for this money. We, we've had meetings with city manager and various um, city council members asking for assistance. So what's the solution? Mayor, any suggestions? Oh, is there a repeat the question? I, I was Mr. just Chair. saying, how do we resolve this? I'm, I'm curious as to how you think we can resolve this. I, I think there are probably um, off the top of my head, maybe three separate approaches. Um, one of which would be in the initial form, just the city funding through the sports commission, right? Any cost that may arise. Um, and that's, I think, one, and maybe the easiest. Uh, second is, you know, particularly, this would be during a budget cycle, um, some sort of further estimate on what costs may be from special events or any type of. Uh, question relating there too. And then third, we'll probably enter into some sort of memorandum of understanding as to the flexibility within budget arrangements. Um, addressing what I think was our 2021 litigation dispute. That probably be my preferred way of solving it uh, because it would be more lasting at the time, but I don't know if others would like that as much. Now, I thought it was asked through the Sports Commission to pay it, and there was no money in that. Is, is that correct? Uh, was it asked for the Sports Commission? Uh, the answer is yes. Um, and then the Sports Commission has expressed that they had exhausted their previous funds. Now, of course, that doesn't limit the city ability to provide them further funds, either for that or any other incident or engagement. So we should invoice the sports commission? The city does contract with them to organize the parade. So um, I think that's, that's perfectly acceptable. And, and indeed, so they address a number of costs relating there too. And for the draft? I don't know what the cost for the draft will be yet, but I mean, if there's an estimate, obviously everybody knows the price of detail, waste detail. So for the mayor, so you already have a cost for the uh, draft over time. But if, if there is, then perhaps that might be the approach. So where are we at on the overtime costs for the mayor's detail? I'm just curious on that. Um, I, I don't have the hard number in, in front of me. Um, I know it typically runs between 150,000 to 180,000 um, each year for the for just the summer. overtime. Yes, just for overtime. So where I'd say we're somewhere between that range. So 
maybe that's something we need to include in that. Yeah, I, I kind of like the, the MOU that the, the mayor talked about, so I don't know. I don't think we can do that now, but I think it's something that we have to, uh, that we have to work on for the, for the immediate future. We're going to be out of money, yeah. and that money, that 200000 200 whatever, we, now we were going to use for salaries. Is that correct? Yes. And what are we speculating the draft is going to cost us in overtime? Um, I, I, we haven't looked at that, but I would say it, it will probably not be as high as it was for the Super Bowl parade for a, a variety of reasons. We have outside resources coming in to help us. Um, and a lot of the uh, the um, assignments will be on-duty personnel and won't be <coughs> overtime like it was for the parade. But still, for those on-duty personnel, there's a cost. Sure, there. I mean, it's taking away from a, a, a regular duty assignments. Right. So yes, the, there will be a cost to it. We're not pretending that we provided security for the Super Bowl parade for two hundred thousand dollars. That's just overtime. We had lots of officers that were regular duty officers. It was much more expensive than that. We're just trying to get paid for the extra that's not in our budget. Correct. Now, there needs to be a way that we can put a total figure to that. I, I think then it puts it in perspective that, you know, we're just <laughs> going ask the accounting the... division to do that <laughs> between now and the end of the year. <laughs> don't think about it. Yeah, don't. But, it, but I think that that number You're is... Right. It's a bigger number. It's pertinent. Well, and I think the problem is we keep putting these things up to talk about and they don't get put in the budget. We keep getting denied. So I just don't know a better way. And, and Mayor, maybe you have a suggestion that we can, you know, communicate this to city council and, you know, perhaps some special <clears throat> meetings or something on, on working towards uh, getting some of this off our plate and back where it needs to go. Yeah, because uh, clearly, you know, events like these help our city's image. And so we certainly don't want them to go away, but we can't go in the hole uh, either while we are you know, making it all work together. So we've, we've got to figure this out because well, we're getting more and more events. City Council, I know a number of them, of them have said that they really support us in the police. So maybe that's where we are. Okay. Too. All right. Next, next. I, well, I do recommend approval to adopt. Oh yeah, the budget. budget, please. All right. I move approval. Second. All right, it's been moved and second. All in favor by sign of aye. 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 All opposed by no. Aye, sir. Item B, budget transfers for fiscal year 2023-24. I request general fund transfers for fiscal year 23-24. The general fund transfer moves 260,000 from personal services and one million seven hundred twenty-five thousand one dollar from capital outlay to contractual services. The total transfer amount is one million nine hundred eighty-five thousand one dollar. This transfer this transfer primarily moves appropriations to accounts that must have appropriations to pay salaries and benefits to existing personnel due to the reorganization of the department. The transfer also moves appropriations to contractual services to allow sufficient funding in categories for the normal operation of the department due to efficiency cuts imposed by the city. Appropriations are being moved into communications for contract work as well. If you do not have any questions, I recommend approval. I move approval. Second. We move and second. All in favor by saying aye. Aye. All opposed by no. I just have it. Item C, renewal of bid number 2023-8, automotive tires. On March 22nd, 2022, the board awarded State Avenue Tire, also known as Blue Valley Goodyear, 
a one-year contract for automotive tires. The original contract period runs through April 30th, 2023, with the option to renew for four additional one-year periods. I recommend approval for a one-year contract renewal with State Avenue Tire, also known as Blue Valley Goodyear, for an anticipated expenditure of $152,074.88. If approved, this will be the first renewal. Move approval. Move and second. All in favor by sign of aye. Aye. All opposed by no. I just have it. Item D, blanket building and property insurance. On April 19, 2022, the board approved the award for a one-year contract renewal to provide blanket building and property insurance coverage to Lockton Companies Incorporated through Zurich North America. During this past contract period, KCPD's property values decreased approximately 2.77% from $135,619,791 to $131,860,375. By leveraging our values with the city's coverage, Lockton Companies was able to obtain coverage for $294,135 annually. This is a 10.5% increase from the previous contract period and is in line with the market standard. This I'm is an, go ahead. This is an annual renewal for a coverage period from May 1st, 2023 through April 30th, 2024, and is in alignment with uh, the city's contract. I want to be sure I understand. This is property insurance, but not for the building because we don't own the buildings. Correct. The city has that contract. That's why we get okay. sort of this deal with piggybacking with them. Mm -hmm. So this is contents? Of contents, those? yes, okay. contents only. I move approval. We move in second. All in favor by sign of aye. And I want to ask one other question. In February, this Lockton is on this bid, but in February, somebody from Lockton gave us rough numbers. They didn't give us a, a, a offer on uh, liability insurance mm. and the numbers were shocking right and we asked that you or somebody from your group and locked in meet with the mayor because the mayor wasn't with us in that meeting i want to be sure that the mayor had a chance to hear those numbers and that we don't need to continue to try and look for liability insurance has that been resolved? Or Let's addressed? finish this motion first. All in favor by sign of aye. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> All opposed by no. I'm I, sorry. I have it. All right. Now you can proceed. <laughs> um, yes. Captain Josh Heinen and a member from uh, Lockton, I believe, met over in the mayor's office. Yes. And if, if, I, if I may, I mean, I, I think that the question is how much exposure we might have. So I believe the number that was estimated, if this is all open session material, if it's not, then somebody just shout at me. It is. Was about, about a quote of $4 million per annum. Um, now, you know, it, the question is just a pure monetary question. If we're facing tens of millions of dollars of potential exposure, I actually can see value in that. Um, you know, after all, we were just fine about $13,000. But uh, if, for example, we don't think that we have that long-term exposure, then perhaps it's not necessary. I just do have concern with several prominent lawsuits where we have people putting numbers on paper that are $25 million here or there. Um, that could be a substantial cost to the department and ultimately the taxpayers. Do you want us to continue with locked in to get a bid for that? You know, I have great respect for Lockton. As I see it, I think that they've probably given us sufficient information on it. And so I think the next would probably be a board discussion as to whether we think that's what we're looking at in balance with what liabilities we may think are ahead of us in years in the future. So will you let us know? I will. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Yeah, I thought what they were willing to pay out was uh, kind of concerning. The deductible was five million dollars per, per incident. Yeah. yeah, but I want, but 
the mayor asked about it and he asked about it in several meetings and I wanted to be sure that we had addressed it and to his satisfaction. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Okay. Right. Item E, excess workers' compensation coverage. The department retains a liability fund for workers' compensation, which is administered through the Office of General Counsel and managed by the company Gallagher Bassett. The Division of Workers' Compensation for the State of Missouri requires the police department to purchase excess workers' compensation insurance. Lockton Companies Incorporated has provided renewal pricing per the City of Kansas City contract. The coverage period is from May 1st, 2023 through April 30th, 2024 at an annual premium of $196,628. If there are no questions, I ask for your approval. I move approval. It's been moved and second. All in favor by sign of aye. 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 All opposed by no. I just have it. Item F. Refer request for proposal 2023-18 plan and investment consulting services. In 2018, the recommendation of the Deferred Compensation Committee, the department awarded a contract to the highest group for the 457 plan and investment consulting services for the Board of Police Commissioners Employee Deferred Compensation Plan. The department is in the final year of the award. In February of this year, 2023-18, 457 plan and investment consulting services RFP was issued. The department received three proposals and the Deferred Compensation Committee recommends awarding the highest group with the contract for one year with the option for four additional one-year periods. The annual cost is $42,000 and is paid by the plan participants at no cost to the department. If you have any questions, um, Mr. Jim Pyle, um, who sits on the Deferred Compensation Committee, uh, is here and available. Otherwise, I request your approval. I move approval. I second it. We moved and second. All in favor by a sign of aye. Aye. All opposed by no. <clears throat> Ayes have it. And you said Mr. Powell is retiring? Um, I didn't say that, but he is. Did somebody tell me that? <laughs> somebody told me that. We just I, broke the I news. I told you that. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I think this is... I think this is his last board meeting. Is that correct? And, and you've been doing this for 20 years? 23. Thank you. Thank you for your time and service. And uh, we have just, just a minute to bring Mr. Powell up. Absolutely. Sure. Absolutely. I just want to recognize um, Mr. Pyle for being such, you know, uh, Jim, please stand. So responsive to our KCPD members, obviously, when when you talk about um, someone's retirement, that's something that uh, people <laughs> work hard for and towards. And it's such a uh, an important and significant part of our benefits that Mr. Pyle takes so seriously. Um, oftentimes he is called by our department members to run the numbers, so to speak, uh, to show if and when would be a good time for our members to, to retire. So it's such a great responsibility that you've taken on and, and you're so friendly and you make it look so easy peasy, uh, but I know there's so much more involved in that. So uh, thank you for all of your time, your dedication and your investment in uh, making sure that our members, uh, while they serve selflessly the 25 plus years that they are taken care of thereafter. And um, if I could please um, present Mr. Pyle with a Chief's Coin as, as a token of our appreciation. Absolutely. I'm doing my best to get through the entire alphabet, but I'm not quite there yet. Did, so did we finish that? <laughs> did we uh, pass that? You did. Okay. I believe. Yes. Sure. Even though I interrupted, you did finally get it. <laughs> All right. Item G. KC ETAC purchases. The Board of Police Commissioners is the fiduciary for the Emerging Threats Analysis Capability System, commonly referred to as ETAC. 
the ETAC governing board is requesting payment to Thomson Reuters, ClearProflex, and Coplink Forensic Logic. The total combined amount is $476,964. You request your approval. Is there a motion? That's a lot of money. <laughs> I move approval. I second it. All right. It's been moved and second. All in favor by sign of aye. Aye. All opposed by no. I have it. I, I will add one thing though. It is a lot of money, but um, this co op agreement, I mean, significantly reduces the amount. Um, that these services would provide if we went out on our own and did that. Um, this amount here is for the ETAC group. It's not just for us, but we, we did look at pricing and, and what it would cost if, if we a la carte these on our own and it's significantly higher. I understand it's an expensive proposition and, and we have to spend the money, but it's just, you know, jaw dropping. <laughs> Item H, request to purchase Cobweb's analytical software. The Law Enforcement Resource Center has identified a subscription-based software known as Cobweb's to aid in the investigation of criminal offenses. This technology will enhance the department's ability to analyze information and generate additional leads for detectives and can provide critical intelligence for investigations. Cost for a one-year subscription is $134,913.76. The cost of this purchase will be funded by the Police Foundation of Kansas City and the Project Safe Neighborhood Grant through the KC Crime Commission. Unless you have any questions, I do recommend your approval. I move approval. I second. Moved and second. All in favor by sign of aye. 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 All opposed by no. I have it. Item I, replacement of bomb and arson response vehicle. The department wishes to, wishes to purchase a new bomb and arson response vehicle to replace the existing one. The current bomb and arson response vehicle was purchased in 2004. With over a thousand call outs and three retrofits, the vehicle is both mechanically and technologically at its end of life. Utilizing General Services Administration government pricing through Ferber Specialty Vehicles, the cost to purchase a new vehicle, new response vehicle is $741,446. The cost of this purchase will be funded with a combination of the Police Foundation of Kansas City and the Public Safety Sales Tax Funds. Unless you have any questions, I do request your approval. I move approval. I second it. Move and second. All in favor by sign of aye. 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 All opposed by no. I just have it. Item J, Midwest HIDA Task Force Grant Agreement. The department recently received notification of the fiscal year 2023 Midwest HIDA Task Force Award of $1,105,945 for the period beginning January 1st, 2023 and ending December 31st, 2024. This program provides funding to improve the effectiveness and efficiency of collecting evidence for narcotics and gang investigations. This is the 26th year and is 100% federally funded. Unless you have any questions, I do I recommend approval to accept this award. I move approval. I second it. probably moved and second. All in favor by sign of aye. 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 All opposed by no. I said it. Item K. Mid-America Mid Regional Council Subaward Fiscal Year 2022 Homeland Security Grant Program Urban Area Security Initiative. The department needs to replace one of the two aging armored rescue vehicles. The Mid-America Regional Council has agreed to subaward the amount of $201,399 from the Fiscal Year 2022 Homeland Security Grant Program Urban Area Security Initiative to assist with the purchase. The department has a match requirement not to exceed $75,000. Unless you have any questions, I request your approval to accept this subaward. I move approval. I second it. Moved and second. All in favor by sign of aye. I have 
Uh, all opposed by no. <clears throat> I just have it. Thank you. Item L, Missouri Western Interdiction and Narcotics Task Force Subaward. The department received a modified subaward for the MoWin Task Force Award for the period of July 1st, 2022 through June 30th, 2023. The funds are awarded to the Department of Public Safety and passed through the Platte County Sheriff's Office to the Kansas City Police Department. The original subaward of $237,221.46 was accepted by the board on August 19, 2022. The department does not anticipate being able to utilize all of the overtime funding before the end of the subaward period, and therefore it is necessary for a modification. I recommend approval to deobligate $20,000 in dedicated overtime funds. I move approval. We move and second. All in favor by signing by. Aye. Aye. All opposed by no. I have it. Item M, final budget transfers for fiscal year 2022-23. This is a walk-on item that was emailed to each of you yesterday. Uh, I request final budget transfers of appropriations to prepare for the closing of fiscal year 2022-23 and prevent accounts from going into deficit. The transfer impacts the general fund, the community policing and prevention fund, the public safety sales tax fund, police drug enforcement fund, and the police grants fund. The general fund transfer moves $426,984 from contractual services in the amounts of $111,917 to personnel, or excuse me, personal services, and $315,067 to commodities. Community Policing and Prevention Fund transfer moves $147,117 from contractual services to personal services. The Public Safety Sales Tax Fund transfer moves $13,372 from capital outlay to contractual services. The Police Drug Enforcement Fund transfer moves $7,880 from contractual services in the amount of $383 to personal services and $7,497 to commodities. And the police grants fund transfer moves $55,343 from personal services in the amounts of $20,852 to contractual services, $20,990 to commodities, and $13,501 to capital outlay. Unless you have any questions, I recommend approval. I move approval. Second it. Moved and second. All in favor by sign of aye. Aye. All opposed by no. I just have it. Item N, adjustments to special revenue accounts for fiscal year 2022-23. Um, this was also a walk-on item and was emailed to you yesterday. ETEC board voted to change participating members' financial contributions. The Kansas City, Missouri Police Department's portion for this year is $169,000. I request approval to move our financial contribution within the special revenue accounts from the Special Services Fund into the ETAC fund, where it will be held to pay ETAC expenditures. I also request your approval to adjust appro appropriations within the special services fund for purchases related to social service outreach and private officers licensing. The request moves $145 from contractual services to capital outlay for private officers licensing to purchase office supplies and $722 from capital outlay to contractual services to assist the social workers with their programs. That shows a negative balance of $577. Let me flip that page, sorry. Five hundred and seventy seven. Well, it's because we're taking it out of there and we're moving it up. If you go to the um, right up above under community support. Right. It's showing that it's coming out of 
capital outlay and going up to, there's not a negative there. It's in parentheses on the capital outlay. Uh, it, it's a, it's in parentheses. So that says to me, it's negative. Well, yeah, yes, because we're pulling it out of, yes, we're pulling it out of there. So we're, we're showing a negative in that account because we are in that category because we pulled it out, but you'll see up top the 577 where it was put in shows a positive. Okay. So we're just moving it from capital outlay to contractual services. All right. Is there a motion? I move approval. I second it. So moved and second. All in favor by sign of aye. Aye. All opposed by no. I said it. That's it. <laughs> exactly. Does that conclude your report? Yes, sir. Uh, Deputy Chief Steve Young. Good morning. Good morning. My section is under tab F. All of the policies in there either had no or minor changes. And if there are no questions, I recommend approval. Um, uh, we're talking about all of them. Whichever one you like. I have a question about um, A, which is the youth youth court and other things, one of the things it says under D is that marijuana possession is a problem. Is that under a city ordinance that it's they're not allowed to possess marijuana? Well, I think it's legal above a certain age, so. All right, right. so it, because it's a juvenile. Right. That's what we're talking about, right. all right. Then on the procedure about the media unit, okay. um, FD4 is what I wrote down, but here's what it says. The media communications unit, the media can contact the communications unit to provide preliminary information. We don't want the media calling the communications unit, do we? Well, they, we do? Yeah, they do. Okay. Yeah. Those, now, people, it, those people are busy. They are. Now, I, I think it's also something that we can't necessarily prevent, but there are times when it's it's helpful. They can, um, they do can. They, do they contact the unit through 911? No, they have, okay. they have the, the They have a number to call. Yes. Okay. Right. I just don't want anybody extra coming in on 911. No, and they have numbers to some of our supervisors. Okay. And that's just been, um, unless we get the number changed, yeah. <laughs> it's not, it just, it actually does help us out. Um, some of our dispatch supervisors can give some preliminary information um, to some scenes instead of like our, our media unit handling every potential situation. Okay. Okay. So it wouldn't be taking a 911 person off. It would be more or less handing. No, it to I, I think they usually call it the uh, okay. communication supervisors direct. And then I had a question about alarm calls. It says. Under patrol procedures. Um, or tab F E. 6G. What I've got is the motor vehicle alarms are exempt from this ordinance. What's the ordinance? There's no ordinance referenced in there that I could see. Which policy are you um, pulling under it from? Tab F. Is this patrol? Okay. E. And it's about alarm calls. Calls for service, I assume, but I don't know. Do you have a page number? That might get me there faster. I'm sorry, I don't. The oh, pages okay. don't oh, I'm show sorry. up very well on okay. what we have, but just a second. Let me see if I can find it. You know what page, Doug? What was the, I think I'm close to it. What, Tab you know? F, mm -hmm. parent E, close parent, and then it says 6G.
And I don't, I don't know why our stuff doesn't match up better. I'm going to okay, look that, into that. So well, and it, may be it shouldn't my fault. be this difficult for me to find it. Um, I will try and remember to put down the page numbers at the bottom. Okay. But um, and now I can't find A6. A6. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. There it is. Okay. And do you see the reference to the ordinance? Oh, motor vehicle alarms are exempt from this ordinance. Uh -huh. What's the ordinance? My, I believe it's the, um, it's the ordinance that, I'm, and I'm not sure actually now that if, if it's still there, the ordinance that requires people to register a, an alarm and then the act, you know, the, the fees that they would incur if we respond to, to numerous uh, false alarms is my, my guess is what that is. Is that ordinance still there, right? From, yeah, okay. So that, that would mean that, so versus an alarm on a building in contrast with an alarm on a car. So any, any vehicle alarm doesn't apply under that ordinance. So I think it ought to at least say what the ordinance is. Or yeah. to the number or something. So if I wanted to look at the ordinance, but I, and I looked back up to see if there's an ordinance somewhere else and I didn't see it anywhere. Yeah. I think we can make that easy. Okay. We'll correct that and bring it back. Okay. And then. Yeah. That's all okay. I had. Yeah. Um, I guess that can be approved with that correction. Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, it, that seems just easy. referred to it as the home alarm, home alarm ordinance, even though we don't know the number of the ordinance. Well, but it's well, not a home alarm because they do it for um, businesses. Oh, it's the okay. alarm section, yeah. So okay, but with that correction, I move approval. Easy, got of it. All, okay. Of all of them. Okay. Second it. All right, we moved and second. All in favor, by sign of aye. 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 All opposed, by no. Ayes have it. That's all I have. Thank you. Good morning, commissioners. Um, my information is under tab G. This is a private officer's license appeal from a February 28th denial of an armed license application. Um, the information regarding the basis for the denial is summarized in Manager Gallagher's memo and the March 14th appeal letter, which um, all should be there under tab G. Ms. Gallagher and I can answer any questions if you have any about this uh, appeal. Any questions? I think we should uh, affirm the decision by the private officers commission. So I move that we do that. You have a second. The decision, the decision to not uh, not, not issue. Okay. It's always hard on these. Mm -hmm. It's not really approval, but I affirm the decision to not issue the the license. I second that. All right. It's been moved and second. All in favor by sign of aye. Aye. All opposed by no. Ayes have it. Thank you, commissioners. That's all I have for now. Thank you. Uh, Office of Community Complaints. Director of Merrill Bennigan. Uh, good morning, Commissioners. Uh, the morning. only thing that we have for today will be a uh, brief executive synopsis and report um, pertaining to the annual report for the Office of Community Complaints for the calendar year uh, 2022. That will be offered by Senior Legal Analyst um, Karen Williams. Good morning. Good morning. Um, just a brief overview of what's contained in our 2022 annual report. Um, a few statistics for you this morning. Um, is that under a tab in our H. book? H is our tab H. All right. Thank you. Um, overall, in 2022, we received 269 complaints. That was an increase of 53 from 2021. Um, say that that's probably due to the end of the pandemic 
Um, and then of course more self-initiated activity as, as things as the city started to reopen um, at the beginning of last year. Our top three categories for complaints last year were improper procedure at 57%, improper member conduct at 12%, and excessive force at 10%. Of those 269 complaints, we sent 157 of them to internal affairs. Um, the remaining 111 we handled in our office and other means, either by mediation, conciliation, or by virtue of the fact that the complaint is not something that we could look at. Of the complaints that we that had full and completed investigations by internal affairs, we had 23 complaints that were closed for non-cooperation uh, with the investigative process, five that were withdrawn, 53 that were closed, 32 exonerated, 29 not sustained, and four sustained complaints should be noted that we actually sustained more than four complaints during the course of 2022, but because of the time it takes to go through the process, some of those are still will be closed in 2023. So some of those four sustained complaints are actually ones we made recommendations on in 2021. Um, just two more quick things. The website's been of great value in getting timely complaints. Um, it, that is the majority of how we get complaints these days. We get very few now from the district stations or from any of our satellite locations. Um, and then also our non-cooperation rate has gone from, at the time that Merrill and I began with the office, close to 50% down to in the 20%. Um, especially in the last three years, I would attribute that to the fact that Internal Affairs is now taking phone interviews of our complainants. So it takes a lot less time out of their day for them to, um, come in and, and provide the information that's needed in order to do that full and complete investigation. And so in lieu of having them come in and sign a typed statement and having to wait around for that, we do get recordings of their statements in the complaint files. Any questions? I have no questions. I thought it was a very thorough and, and informative report. Thank, Thank you. you. And it will be up on our website later today. Just to um, conclude that, um, I just wanted to say that um, from an administrative standpoint, the uh, usage of the body-worn cameras has been uh, nothing less than a godsend uh, for our agency to be able to see these events in real time. I know when, uh, when she mentioned the number of files that were closed, a lot of those files were closed because we were able to actually see the incident, see the event and determined that there was no violation of policy and procedure. I also want to commend the department and command staff on the uh, rollout and usage of the body-worn cameras. I don't want to date myself, but I happened to be around at the time that the NCAR camera videos were used. And uh, needless to say that the usage, it took some time for the, the members to get used to turning on the cameras and making sure that they're operational, but we have not seen um, those type of hiccups with the body-worn camera. Um, we're getting clear images, uh, clear sound, um, and it's, it's been working very well. So uh, the command staff and the training staff is to be commended on, on that as well. Um, and as Karen stated, um, a lot of the complaints now that we get, we're seeing a, a sea change. Most of the complaints that we're getting now are coming actually through the website. Um, it's very rare to get visits to the, we talked about this yesterday, visits to the division stations or even the Office of uh, uh, Community Complaints. Where, um, so. Uh, we're going to make sure that um, that option remains a viable one. Even there's some, some more stuff that we can do that's going to be more beneficial to the public in terms of uh, information sharing and, and contact with the office in the process through that website. So again, uh, Commissioner Dean, I know that you were the champion for that effort, and I just wanted to make sure that you knew just um, how much of a, a, a tool it's been for us to be able to do our work. So thank you very much. Uh, how quickly do you all have access to the body-worn camera footage? Almost instantaneously. Um, it's, it's also enabled us to do some different things in terms of evaluating incidents that may or may not rise to a complaint. Uh, we're able to uh, make ready contact with the Internal Affairs Unit, uh, give them some necessary parameters or criteria surrounding the event. They can make take an instant look, invite us down, we take a look at it and we can make some judgments as to how the, uh, what's the best course of action to take to, um, to resolve it. So yeah, it's, it's been pre pretty great. Good. Thank you. And we, 
we said when we asked for the money, and as you know, we asked for three years in a row before we got the money, but when we asked for the money, we said, we think this will help our officers. We're proud for people to see how we do our work, and I'm glad that it helps. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we need approval of open session minutes from March 28th. I move approval. I'll second it. We move it in second. All in favor by sign of aye. Aye. All opposed by no. Ayes have it. Public comments. I have uh, one person, Rachel, with Casey Lee. Rachel, are you here? They, they've left. Okay. All right. Um, Chief uh, Stacy Reyes. Good morning. Yeah, good morning, Commissioners, okay. Mr. Mayor. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention this or at least um, talk about it in some way. Um, the tragedy of our Kansas City teen shot in our city was and remains at the top of our minds here at the Kansas City, Missouri Police Department. Uh, we have reviewed the incident internally uh, to ensure we recognize and continue to put forth the needed efforts in our investigations. And I want to thank our Kansas Cityans for understanding the need for their police department to thoroughly investigate incidents in our city within a timeline that is needed for the case at hand. So I want to thank our, our Kansas Cityans for uh, having faith in our police department that we have thoroughly and objectively investigate incidents in our city and compile detailed case files so prosecutors have all the information they need to make the best charging decision on a case uh, moving forward. Uh, to, to, in addition to put forth the required elements of a case to ensure a just outcome. Uh, we want our city to know that we are committed to justice in every case and work every day to seek that justice for the victims of all crimes. Um, as we continue to work with our city, our county and community leaders in the formation of a citywide collective approach to combat violent crime together, uh, we also continue to look inward at KCPD. And as we've talked about before over the past weeks, we have announced a reforming of the missing person squad. Uh, the missing person squad is not the only squad we've reformed or refocused. Uh, we have also formed a squad to focus uh, specifically on illegal firearms. And I'll tell you one of the, the as a, a reason why for that is recently over the past weeks, a packet of our city in the east side in the area of 3-5 and Prospect has experienced incidents of violent crime. And in the small geographical area, there were over 200 shots fired and 30 incidents in seven days, uh, several victims of non-fatal shootings, and one of those victims was under the age of five. Uh, there were also two homicides. Uh, KCPD immediately deployed proactive officers to the area 24 hours a day to provide three things, and that was presence, community engagement, and enforcement. Uh, in addition, our community engagement division, led by Major Kari Thompson, gathered our community partners and canvassed the, the neighborhood twice in one week to reach people where they are, and that's at their front door. Our neighborhood leaders held a community meeting to bring people together to discuss resources and solutions to help end violence in the area. Uh, we're also focusing on youth violence in the southern part of our city. This past Friday night, KCPD and our community partners uh, specifically the Community Engagement Division, held a community discussion with youth who live in South Kansas City. So I want, I want our Kansas Cityans to know that their, their police department, we're paying attention. We're listening and we are responding. We care about all neighborhoods in Kansas City and we want all areas of our city to be safer. 
Uh, the women and men of the Kansas City, Missouri Police Department serve selflessly every day, all doing great work in our city to help people. And our, we're dedicated to a safer Kansas City. So I just wanted to recognize some of the things that our police department um, is doing in response to things that we are seeing in our city to, to help uh, violent crime and to suppress overall crime period, make Kansas City a safer place. So um, with that, uh, we look forward to having another safe um national or worldwide event with the NFL draft. We are ready and we are prepared for another safe event. So thank you. Any questions for me? Questions for the chief? All right. Uh, David Kenner. Yes, thank you. One thing I wanted to address today was the request from uh, Mayor Lucas and the Office of the City Auditor on, by letter dated March 1st uh, for the department to complete the government risk assessment checklist, uh, which they say is required of city boards and commissions. Um, the caveat we've got here is that while we certainly are the board of police commissioners for the uh, city of Kansas City and the Kansas City Police Department, we still are a state board. And so we have a separate governance procedure uh, we, in terms of how the board operates, it's governed by chapters 84 for the police department in Kansas City and chapter 536, the administrative, administrative procedure and review uh, section of the revised statutes of Missouri. So it's not exactly, doesn't quite exactly match up. There is a provision in the city ordinance though for voluntary participation for other boards and commissions providing public services to the city, but not constituting governing or policy boards of the city or as a component thereof. And so what I would suggest is that since we're not really falling within the city management structure, and in fact, not at all, that we have kind of a uh, rump committee, so to speak, of the board uh, to meet and go over what kind of response we could provide in connection with that survey and provide that later on uh, to the uh, city in terms of what the board does, how its policies and procedures work. And so I would request that the board do that. Uh, and the and, uh, President Tolbert, you could identify who those uh, members could be at a later date. Because they, they have a deadline on there of, is it April 30th? Or? Well, I don't know that there's any magic to that date. They prepare their, uh, it says they uh, summarize their responses and report to the city council no later than November 1st. So I think we have time. Um, And is it a is it a lengthy assessment? Uh, I haven't really looked at it. It's it's just a survey. Okay. Uh, what they're asking is to basically for us to describe what we do. What we do is set forth in Chapter eighty four and Chapter five thirty six of the revised statutes. We comply with state law. Is it a statement, David, that you could prepare and then each of the board members look at it and sign off on it? Well, I think what we're probably more holistically to look at what our policies are. Is there some things we could change in terms of and still uh, fall within what the state requires and basically outline what we're doing now? Because I think that's probably going to wind up being more responsive to what the city wants. So you think we should just put together a committee? Of course, it's not that many of us. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so is it something that we can discuss in closed? Yeah, I don't know that there's any that? particular magic uh, to who would be on it. I don't know that it ne necessarily needs to be enclosed. I would suggest uh, certainly Jenny Atterbury would be on it. I could serve on it. Um, it's probably going to be more legalistic, and so those of us who are lawyers might take the labor. Sounds good to me. <laughs> <laughs> it always does. But we're getting ready to have a new commissioner that's a lawyer, so right. well, welcome, and he's here today, so uh, we're, we're happy that he's coming on board with us. I'm happy to serve. We already have a job yeah. assigned. Okay. So then if, if uh, our vice president, Kathy, will serve 
with you and uh, Attorney Arterberry, I would think that would get us down the road. Uh, All right. Yes, and right. the chairman of the committee should be David, so he can Good. lead us through that. So moved. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Is that it, David? Yes. Thank you. All right. Mayor Lucas? Uh, I wanted to take... I'm sorry, I have a feedback. I wanted to, first of all, welcome Tom Whitaker to the Board of Police Commissioners. Tom has been an outstanding lawyer and businessman and Kansas City in generally. And so we look forward to working with him, appreciate his very highly paid service to the people of Kansas City. Uh, with that, that's all I have for now. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Kramer? Yes, well, I would like to welcome Tom as well. Uh, we're happy to have you here and happy he was able to join and observe today. So I uh, appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. Um, I would also like to say, I know my hearts and prayers go out to all those family members with, it's been a crazy month between, like you said, 35th and Prospect, a kid under five years old, you know, that's just not okay. And, and we need to get this violent crime uh, under, you know, control more. Um, and my heart goes out to Ralph and his family. I can't imagine. I've got a young, young boys, teenage boys that went to Staley as well. And I know that's uh, really, really tough. And I'm thinking that could be my kid. That could be my dad, the 85 year old. And, you know, I, I like to look at solutions and, you know, my, my son used to be a DoorDash person too. And I'm like, man, we just need to build awareness out there in our community to be careful and take precautions because it's, you never know. And it was just such a misfortunate thing. And with the, I, I know I am observing my dad right now getting a little dementia and that's really tough. And one thing that I know we have done as uh, all of you know his children is we've taken all the guns out of the house just in case. And I, I know that's um, hard because my dad was in law enforcement. So, you, know, you feel like you don't want to take away their power. But uh, I just think it's things that as a community we just need to be aware of and, and be safe out there. And my prayers go out to all those families. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Dean? Well, I wanted to say thank you to the communications unit. Last week was they were to be recognized nationwide for their work. We recognize them every day. The communications unit is our lifeblood. If people need help, they call 911 and those people are the ones that answer. And if we don't have people there, we don't have any way to know what to do. So we really appreciate you. And we thank you for being there every day. Thank you, Commissioner Dean. Um, I want to thank the chief and, and the mayor that uh, really kept the community informed of what was going on and uh, just kind of made some good moves to make sure that we had security, but, but kind of undercover security. So it wasn't so obvious. So uh, you kept things in shape uh, and, and we appreciate your leadership. We also welcome uh, Tom Whitaker as he's coming on the board. Uh, as I told him, it's a very thankless position, but uh, <laughs> we do what we do uh, because we are committed to the city and we care about it. And so um, I am uh, actually uh, on my way out this year uh, probably in November, I'll be going off the board after six years. It's amazing how the time flies, but uh, I have uh, just had a, a great time uh, seeing the inner workings of how things work. And of course, we had the opportunity to put the new chief in. And so I, I, am, uh, I am satisfied that, that I've been able to make some impacts during the six years, even though it, it passed by a whole lot quicker than I really uh, anticipated. 
And so we've had a great meeting today. We're looking forward to um, uh, a good closed session. And thank you all for being here and those for watching. Thank you. Uh, I move that we adjourn this open session and go into closed session. Dean, I. Albert, I. Kramer, second, and I. <laughs> <laughs> Mayor Lucas, you going to join us in closed? Okay. okay. All right. Thank you. All right.